Hey, you with the dice. Yeah, the latest shiny is nice. But let us show you real adventure. So be it! So somebody, I don't care who, tell me what is going on. This, I can take it, is the old school. Boys of Light! Times two. Welcome to Thaco's Hammer, the best damn AD&D second edition podcast ever. I'm having a hard time starting the show when I got Alistair Crowley staring at me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Don't encourage him, Glenn. He'll, he'll I keep won't, impersonating. I won't. Hiya, folks. Thaco's Hammer, Splatbook 63. We're going to do Ratman and other things today or something like that. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, we got a brainstorm, too. Okay, I'm DM Glenn. Hello, DM Fulon, since you're looking at me. Okay. Greetings, Gamer Nation. Yes, we The original have... Metalhead is back from the road, broadcasting from home today. Yay, yes, we do have the cameras on. Some of us. <laughs> yes. And DM Brian. Hi, Hi Brian. Hey, Glenn. Hey, folks. What's hi, going hi, on hi. out there? What's doing? This is this is the the semi annual. We tell people what we're up to and show them show them all the neat stuff we got and brag and maybe do a show too. Yeah, maybe. Uh, <laughs> let's go to hits and crits. Well, one thought he was invincible; the other thought he could fly. So, they were both wrong. Son of a bitch is dug in like an Alabama tick. You're hit. You're bleeding, man. I ain't got time to bleed. We're sending somebody in to negotiate. Anybody else want to negotiate? Hits and crits. Hits and crits. Yes, sirree. Full on. I think I'm going to always defer to you since I'm staring right at you. <laughs> Well, I've been getting elbows deep into a whole bunch of anime watching, anime catching up on, watching things like that. Uh, uh, been constantly busy on the road with the truck, so having an internet connection I can game on is rare and few and far between, but I still get a little bit of my Star Wars The Old Republic on. Uh, and I've been catching up on watching a bunch of other anime and then sharing a bunch of other anime with my co-hosts. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> to to catch up, because they are way behind. Oh, well, I'm way behind. Uh, I have no time. But, yeah, I get what you're saying. I mean, I appreciate I appreciate it full on, but when, yeah, I opened up my, I opened up my mailbox, and I see that package, I'm like, oh, I'm like, I didn't order anything for Amazon this time that I opened up, I'm like, oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then Glenn uh, shows what full on sent him on Facebook, and I'm like, Okay, I, I think I dodged a bullet this time. Then two days later, <laughs> nope. <laughs> and there well, it is. Got, I'm like, oh, boy. Hmm? I sent you, everything I sent you, I sent him. Yes, wow. he did. Yes, he did. I, I got the stuff Not like two days later. Master, that's all. <laughs> uh, wow. Yeah, this he's been uh, our friend here has been overly generous. And we're never going to be able to repay him, which means we have to do the show until we die. Yeah. And we have to have a table together at Gen Con, which won't be this year because Gen Con this year has officially canceled. That's right. They are officially doing the Gen Con online, but yeah. my reservation is still active and rolled forward into next year, so I'm already paid for next year's Gen Con. Mm-hmm. Well, so I'll friend, be going to that. Well, my friend, this today, Sunday, is the last day of North Texas RPG Con, which I did not go to, mm-hmm. which they still held. But was also holding virtually. And I right. think most people, but most people I knew said, "I can't go. I can't go. I can't go." And I said, "Okay, we can't go either." Mm-hmm. And we rolled over till next year. So, yep. That's next good. year, all we have to worry about is the room. So, <laughs> isn't that yeah. the way it is every year for you, Glenn? What do you mean the room? Uh, yeah, the room's always always the biggest uh, concern. Yeah. I guess it is. I just want to make sure we you know we can afford it. We can have we have a roommate and all this other stuff. But I just saved. Uh, I just Beck. I just saved Becky and I about four hundred bucks by not going. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, I hear that. So uh, because you know I get I get my share from the roommate, but it goes right in my pocket. Mm-hmm. Yep. 
It's like this, this is this is con expenses. Yeah, I was gonna say yeah, that go- and that money goes straight to the dealer's room. <laughs> yep, most of it. I've had years where I brought home like a hundred bucks. Mm-hmm. Every year it's a lot. Name I one. Less, less. <laughs> Oh, I've already got Nine, it, so I don't 20, need to buy it again with the exception of dice. 2017. Okay, I was joking, I, Clint. I, I, know, I know you were. I brought home enough to buy my youngest grandson a blue snowball. Cool. So, yeah, because I just said, I told Becky, I says, I have $100. Don't question where it came from. I'm buying my grandson. <laughs> <laughs> I have this money. Don't question where it came from. Yeah. Got it. <laughs> Not like she thinks I'm doing drug deals on the side or anything. Well, yeah, but you know, when you say when you say don't question where it came from, yeah, it tends to raise. A she little knows suspicion. exactly where it came from. Yeah. Does that mean we have to make our own Netflix show called Saving Bad instead of Breaking Bad? D and D show is called Saving. Hey, that's actually a good idea. You're welcome. What have you been doing, Brian? Oh, let's see. Um, well, my job just put me back on full time hours. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, and but on the on the bad side, the company that I worked with for uh, healthcare for oh my goodness, uh, since like what two thousand and ten, about two thousand eleven, say about nine years. Yeah, they sh- they had to shut their doors down. Uh, because you know their lack of business with COVID for and good, everything else. For good. For yeah, good? for good. Yeah. Oh, they're out of business. Wow. Yeah, they're out of business. They had to shut down. Which Every is once while I see that during COVID, and it's always a shock. Yeah. It, well, um, and it's it's just rough right now, and it's too bad because Michigan's starting to open back up in stages. Um, like most of the bars and restaurants, I think start back up on the twelfth. And then uh, other businesses, I think, start up like uh, a week after that. You know, of course, they're keeping an eye on, you know, uh, a sudden spike in COVID cases and so forth. You know, like what's been going on in like Florida and like, uh, you know, all the a lot of the states that have decided to just open up whole hog and not be cautious. (laughs) So, well, you um, know, well, you know, uh, Pier 1 Imports is dead. Now. Yeah, I know. There was a Pier 1 in my neighborhood. Yeah, they I mean, gone. I know it was dying. They were in they were in chapter 11 bankruptcy. But with mm-hmm. the COVID was like it, that was like the coup de grace. Yeah, they that was said, the death they just said sure. can't we just can't can't we just liquidate and the court said, "Yeah, go ahead, liquidate." Yeah. Yeah, that's... So COVID COVID put the nail in the the final nail in the coffin right there. Mhm. Yeah, I believe it. And, and the entire Sears wing of my mall has been stripped to the ground foundation and is mm-hmm. something else is either being built or they're just making a bigger parking lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you they, got they, they cut it. They, they amputated the building from the mall and have leveled it wow. in the month that I've been gone. Wow. Mm-hmm. That sounds about right. I mean, Sears has been dying a slow death for the last like four or five years. You no, know, help. Help Penny J C Penny's closing. Yep. There's yeah. stores some, a lot of stores too. Yeah. I mean the department store is dying. I, you can't you know Yeah. You can't anyway, to to get off on a tangent. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that yeah, it, it's true. I mean but it's their it, fault for not selling game dice and game materials and game books and game stuff. <laughs> Maps. So Damn that's it. why so that's why Toys R Us died. <laughs> yes. Toys R Us used they to only sell D and D stuff. Sold starter sets of plastic friggin' wax dice and we're, let the uh, um, fear monger people put them out of selling anything more than you know your basic dungeon master's guide and mm-hmm. players handbooks mm-hmm. at, well, on the few that you could find that had one in the shelf so yeah. Yeah. they deserve it then, no then diversity again, yeah, well then again you can still go to Walmart and buy the 5e starter set <laughs> Yeah, and isn't that yeah, funny? Yeah, I know. Whoop de do. And no, that's that's hilarious to me considering how staunchly Christian the Walton family is. Well, you know what's you know what's even it more interesting? You can pr- you can buy like the main books for Five E and other books online on Walmart dot mm-hmm. com. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that isn't blows, that funny? You know, that blo- I went on there looking for role playing games one day, and I'm going, 
Shoot! Look well, at all. That. But think, think about this, Glenn. The Walton family used to buy, used to own Walden Books, and Walden Books had a massive D and D selection way back in the eighties. I didn't know. I didn't know they owned Walden. Yes, they did. Wow. Yes, they did. Incredible. Yeah, and yeah, but they weren't. They weren't the retail juggernaut back in the early to early to mid eighties. You know, they became that once they re- once they got their the model for Walmart together and they branched out of uh, Arkansas. So mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, you didn't start hearing about Walmart's opening up until like what the late eighties, early nineties, I think. And, yeah, and then they weren't superstores either. No, they, were they just, weren't. <laughs> they're just regular. Yeah, I they're... mean, they had they it was back when they just had like a smattering of grocery stuff mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. the store. Yeah, yeah you're but, yeah, yeah you're absolutely right. But D and D, you know, D and D and Walmart, you can find it. Yep. Um, it still kind of blows me away, but you can still find it. I know it. Yeah, that 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 just that makes me laugh. It honestly does. It really does. But yeah, so um, let's see. Um, two weeks what ago, else? two weeks yes. ago, I put out um, episode twenty six of uh, Confessions of an Arcade Addict, talking Good for you. talking about the sequel to the classic game uh defender the game's called stargate and yeah remembering all of the things that you know all the things i saw with that game back in 1981 that was fun um i'm probably going to record one episode 27 this coming weekend and you know just trying to keep everything afloat over here that's pretty much what i'm doing what about you glenn well well, I've been working on some game stuff. I still got, you know, Radio Grognard is still chugging away. Mm-hmm. Uh, last week, I passed the two-year mark for my for Radio Grognard. Congratulations. I couldn't believe I couldn't believe I had a two-year line of BS out there. <laughs> hey, daily BS. People like it. Um, the users slow again but you know i'm getting there i've got a couple of couple of basic fantasy books i want to throw up there as soon as i finish off the second one i got mm-hmm. they, they put out like four new basic fantasy books so i had to grab them mm-hmm. basic fantasy supplements like the equipment the equipment guide's funny mm-hmm. the equipment guide's funny but it's like four books four good size supplements 17 dollars mm-hmm. on amazon nothing wrong with that and i had prime so it was like seventeen bucks. You can't you can't go in the store and buy stuff like this mm-hmm. for that price. No, you can't. There is no there is no friggin' way. Speaking. I like their equipment I like their equipment guy because not only is it the usual stuff, but it has stuff they actually give you what the damage is for a punch or a kick. Mm-hmm. And the average damage for improvised weapons. I mean, how often yep. do you see that kind of stuff in a in a role playing game book? Mm, not very often. I can only say always it. go ahead. That kind of stuff they always they only like blow it away. Oh well, it just does this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, DM fiat and all that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I I like that. I like that. They, they they've done a little bit more more. They went an extra step, which is mm-hmm. good. Let's see what else. Uh, I watched one episode of something that, of a uh, what Full On sent me. Uh-huh. I watched episode one of Goblin Slayer. Uh huh. What did you think? And I liked it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like that that episode and probably the series is the very definition of TPK. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> Just the way they they were, it was. I mean, this is not record of Lotus War. This is this is not high fantasy. This is down and dirty fantasy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Nothing wrong and with that. Gage and Gavin always said, "Well, do you watch the rest of them?" I said, "No, I haven't." But if I had a couple of grandsons who would sit out and watch it with me, maybe I would. <laughs> oh, that there's a hint. <laughs> instead, of st- instead of sticking their head in a, in a computer screen. Mm-hmm. Well, welcome to the 21st century, just, Glenn. Just, just start it next to them and. You will magically magnetize them off of their keyboards and tablets. It will just happen. Didn't work with the martial arts stuff. No, that's <laughs> uh, they're kids. They they're not they're not going to be into what we're into unless they're either force fed or they come by it naturally. <laughs> well, you know, Gage does like Big Trouble Little China, so I figured he likes some of the more out there mm-hmm. um, martial arts stuff. But it's like oh, I'm going to go and do this. Mm-hmm. Well, I did get. I get. I played some online gaming. I played a game of Guardians yesterday with the uh, 
with the Austin guys. They were running their own four day con online because they didn't go. They didn't go to North Texas either. Mm-hmm. But the they're the Royal Dragoons, so they had their own server and all this other stuff. Mm-hmm. And so I got to play Guardians for the first time, which was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. It's a good suit. It's a good supers game. Yeah, it's it's white box based supers. Huh. Interesting. And I oh no, I saw that. That's right. No, I seen that. Yes. And uh, I got to play. I didn't get to play supers. I got to play super agent though. Mm-hmm. I got to play Agent Tang of the agency. Mm-hmm. Oh, so you played yeah. you played him like um, what's his face? I said I I told him uh, since he had his his big power thing was super martial arts. Mm-hmm. Nothing and, wrong with that. And and guns like a nine millimeter, and he had his own VTOL, which was basically a Quinjet and all this other stuff. Right. And I said. I told him, I'm basically going to p- play him as Tashiro Mifune as a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent. Cool. And I like that idea. Worked. You know, we had to go investigate these craters that were showing up, and that this took place in 1983. Okay. And so we had to investigate these craters in these, these towns, one in Russia and, and one in the U.S. We went to the U.S. one. Mm-hmm. This small, small town it caused some damage. They don't know where it happened, where it came from. Mm-hmm. But we found these like little drilling robots that were getting a radio signal from somewhere. Right. And we found out where it was. We found out there was this cabal that was trying to get the Soviet Union and the U.S. to destroy each other so they can come in and have the right people run the con- run the world. <laughs> you know, very elitist mm-hmm. uh, group saying, oh, the smart people should run the world and all that kind of stuff. But their little robots had a signal that would degrade um, degrade um, the shielding around nuclear weapons. So they're trying to dig towards the nuclear weapons dumps ah. in America and basically trying to get them to blow up. It's trying to blow and, them up, right. Yeah. And so we, we, my shtick was everywhere we go from investigating this one shop to the fire department, I'd always fumble around in my coat pocket and find the right ID. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, and I didn't care if they believed me or not. Like the, the, the little shop, they had some damage. I just said I was an insurance investigator and pulled it out. Mm-hmm. Then I went to the fire station next door and I said, I'm the. Uh, I'm the Boise health. I'm the Boise fire inspector. <laughs> there, that should have been one of your superpowers. Always having the right ID. <laughs> yeah. And the third time we had to go to that company that was like the front mm-hmm. for it, and I just pulled this one out and I looked at it and I go, "I'm from the cable company. This is my crew." <laughs> oh yeah. And I had a crew. We had this one woman who looked like some kind of anime wizard. We had one guy in a wheelchair and so These are the people who are going to check out the interference we're getting from our customers. Mm-hmm. Yep, yeah. That was my cover story. That's funny. Which was nice because I found a soundboard, so when we were fighting, I got to... Oh, right, got it. <laughs> yeah. So got, that was a Got lot. to have a little fun, got it. <laughs> and it was it was a fun game, it really was. Um, mm-hmm. the, the, oh, that, that anime with this, this girl found this magical amulet and staff. Uh-huh. That gave her magic power. She could transform into this taller, more gorgeous wizard. And she was like this young college student who mm-hmm. was very, she was very uh, plain, jinky. No, uh, I want to say Tissandra, but more jinky. So she was like a magical girl type personality. Uh huh. But she assumed she had certain spell powers all her reference books and her spell book was D D reference books so <laughs> she assumed she was a D wizard uh-huh. but the amulet never worked that way uh-huh she wanted something to do to happen and something else would happen mm-hmm. it's like well according to this magic missile supposed to hit this isn't a magic missile nope you got <laughs> something different you know, the, guy, the, the guy in the wheelchair, I love his name, Professor Paladin. Uh, <laughs> um, he would he would press a button on his wheelchair and he would launch the super suit, which would envelop him and part of the wheelchair. And all of a sudden he could walk. All of a sudden he's Iron Man. Uh huh. Uh huh. Another guy named Speed Bump, who was a sergeant in the army, who got had an accident with a road 
the thing that made asphalt and concrete for the road. So mm-hmm. now he can call and have his body. He looked like Ben Grimm. Mm-hmm. But he could throw these concrete balls. And <laughs> it's like, this is this is interesting. <laughs> yeah. We had a couple. Yeah, yeah. At this point, you're the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. What's that other movie? The one with the bowler. Oh, the, the Avengers? No, no. not the... Um, oh, what were they called? Dang oh, it. yeah, I know. The uh, Kings... The... Kingsman. Kingsman. Yeah, the King, yeah, Kingsman. Yeah, that's yeah. what I'm thinking, because you guys got these really weird and disparate powers. <laughs> I had a gadgeteer as a partner, and his name was Jerry Rigg. Oh. oh. <laughs> yeah, you know you came up with a horrible pun if Glenn's... If Glenn's Giving giving you the boo urns. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we had a lot of fun. That's me. That's all that matters. So let's do some emails. Okay. Well, we only have one. Okay, that's fine. Uh, all right. Let me just get we to can, it real we can, quick. We can argue a bit for that. So yeah. All right. Here we go. <laughs> we have an email from uh, DM Mikey, who is a regular emailer to the show. He has a really interesting question. He likes it. Hey, Mikey. Yeah, exactly. Okay, dear Thaconians, uh, just listened to episode 156 where you read an earlier email of mine. Okay, in my defense, I had no long, had no idea how long that email was when I sent it. Oh my goodness, it was at least a year old, probably older. Um, anyway, an earlier episode made me think of the Buck Rogers game TSR released in the early 90s. Evidently because Lorraine's family owned the rights to the property. Yeah, that's true. Right. You know, they, they, somehow they got it from the Dill family. Uh, let's see. In essence, it was a science fiction setting using second edition rules. So my questions are this. Uh, do you have any experiences with the game? And what do you think about AD&D for other genres? What are your experiences with that? Thanks and, well, I, and appreciate everything you do. Michael Robinette, a.k.a. I wish I was DMing Mikey. Thank you, Mikey. Mm-hmm. Well, I could say with all certainty and much happiness that I have never dealt with the Buck Rogers game. Mm-hmm. Well, I did. I played not the my, I played the uh, Gold Box uh, Buck Rogers game, and I had a lot of fun with it. It was interesting. You not know. my not my wheelhouse. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, but other genres. Is he talking about other genres with D and D? Yeah, using D and D for other you know, it's, uh, not so much like game setting like stuff in the back of the. DMG where it talked about here's your conversion stats for Boot Hill, Boot Hill. Here's your conversions, or when you got into yeah, Gamma it wasn't World yeah Gamma World because um, th- th- that was well, my extent of that is I've done Gamma World type stuff uh, when I was on my way into yeah when I was on my way into some Traveler and some Star Frontiers uh, but uh, haven't actually done Boot Hill but uh, the mechanic is the mechanic we we've seen that the utility of it is across all platforms anyway when they started doing the D20 system stuff. So, mm-hmm. you know, I've got the entire Spycraft and Stargate and World of Warcraft D20 sitting on the shelf yep. for a reason, because it's good did, and it works. They, they did D20 Star, uh, Stargate? Oh, yes. I and if you want out. to play D20 Star Wars, the oh, first yeah. thing you should buy is the D20 Stargate books because that has all the gun and ranged combat feats that all troopers and blaster people in Star Wars need mm. to be what they're supposed to be. Right. But yeah, I mean be that all they, they well yeah, they can be, yeah. well, you know, that kind of thing, you know, ever since the OSR, that has adapting like older editions of D and D and stuff to other genres has become kind of a cottage industry. Yes it has. Yes, indeed, it has. Yeah. Mistara is the latest in that cottage industry. Yes, yes, really. And yeah, oh, oh yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I've I've seen. All you have to do is follow Bruce Hurd on Facebook, and he shows that stuff, or at least people in his in his threads try to show that stuff. And I mean, there was a bit of a de- a bit of a right. debate about it. Um, I mean, but- if you if you look at. If you look at like um, Vaults of Pandius, mm-hmm. oh you yeah, know, great the, resource the by the way. Mis- mis- yes, for Mistar and stuff like that. There's always somebody who's trying to adapt something of Mistar to the current edition. Yep, or something. Always, always. Yeah. And um, yeah. By the way, shout out to Jason Higdon who recently did. Um, 
all of the Gazetteer uh, Nation maps and did them with uh, oh, Campaign gosh. Cartographer 3, and they are gorgeous. Um, I actually was able to catch him on Twitch um, last week, as a matter of fact, while he was... Um, he, you know, he was basically streaming how he does it, and you know, it was fascinating to watch. And the and the guy is knowledgeable about D and D and Mastara in in uh, particular, so it was really good talking to him. Um, but yeah, I mean, with getting back to the Buck Rogers thing, the funny part about that email was is that um, I had just said on Facebook because someone else brought up Buck Rogers, you know, the 25C campaign setting, which is actually pretty good. It's basically, a, like right, Mikey said, it's a second edition, AD&D, uh, altered a little bit, changed a little bit for the pulp uh, Buck Rogers uh, universe. Um, right. I wish they'd done Flash Gordon. That would have been awesome, too. But my well, whole... we've already got What's that. What's the so. difference? Yeah. Mm, <laughs> I mean, between... A little got bit. That, that Buck Rogers, that um, Flash Gordon, that Rocketeer, it's all... You can wipe the serial numbers off of that and just throw them all into a campaign together, and you won't know the know the difference really. That's true. Well, if, uh, if you were trying to do the, you know, TV series Buck Rogers, that's Marcus. a different animal, and you could do that with a D twenty system easily. Well, you know, um, Pinnacle well, has see. got a very. They just recently had a like a couple of years ago. They did Buck Rogers for Savage Worlds. Yeah, I mean, that was the thing. Well, that was my point, is that I wanted a... Uh, I wanted the 70, the 1979 Buck Rogers series done. Exactly. Yeah, that's what I wanted, more than anything else. I mean, I've been... And thank God for uh, um, cha- uh, cable channels like MeTV that show Buck Rogers every Sunday night, you know, at like 10 o'clock or something like that, um, because... I got back into watching them, and I'm just like, oh, I remember this. Oh, there's the episode with Gary Coleman as the boy genius. You know, oh, there's Dorothy Stratton as this genetically perfect woman who Buck Rogers has to guard, and not only guard uh, her, but also guard her against trying to seduce him, because she was hitting on him pretty hard. Hard through that episode. Space vampire. Oh, God, that one. Yes. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, you know, yeah. It, it, yeah. So yeah. yeah, I mean, those. I forgot how much fun those episodes were. You know, I probably took them a little for granted because in 1979, I'm only like what 10 years old. But you know, I mean, it's they're just fun, fun to watch. It's when they decided to rip off, do a rip off of Star Trek, is when the series went downhill, and, and probably the reason why they got canceled. Because yeah. they, they that show was doing really well for you know the first like season and a half then they went this whole different direction with a whole new cast and you know all of a sudden you know kick-ass Wilma Deering becomes like a a combination of Mr. Sulu and uh, Lieutenant Uhura you know and it's just like no it's not the same it's not good you know I mean even Gil Gerard panned it because he he said he went to the, the the producers of the show and said, you guys are ripping off Star Trek. This guy Hawk is a rip off of Spock and so forth and so on. But I would love if somebody actually took either, you know, took a, took D20 and just said, Hey, this is what we're going to do. We got the original Buck Rogers over here. That's been in existence since what the thirties, I think. Mm -hmm. And, you know, now we're going to take the 1970s version in all of its disco glory. And we're going to, you know, and we're going to make a a campaign setting out of it. I would, I'd buy that in a heartbeat. I honestly, did I, did I say pinnacle did Buck Rogers in Savage worlds? Did I say that? I think you did. Yeah. I meant, I meant flash Gordon. Oh, yeah. Okay, that makes more sense. Because uh, from what I looked at, it's like full-on flash, ah. <laughs> yes, that's what that's what I would love to see. Just, yeah, let's go to the campy 1980 movie and make that campaign yes. world. I mean, you could take they second did. edition D- D&D and do that I without any problems. I it's really, really good. Okay. Um, but, yeah, I can... Lost the train of thought there. Oh yeah, I so for some somewhere in the garage I have my copy of Slipstream, 
which was Pinnacle's Savage World, Sci-Fi World of, okay, we can stop publishing this now that we got the real Flash Gordon or the real Flash Gordon. Mm-hmm. That so makes sense. yeah, they they dropped they dropped it the minute they got the IP for Flash because oh. that's what they wanted. They yeah, yeah. I think Flash I think Gordon they. They might have done that to actually show they can actually do Flash Gordon justice. Although right. that's not that's not hard. <laughs> you know, but, I mean my, go ahead. But Mikey, if you if you probably don't already know, go look at like stuff like stuff like Night Owl Workshop, who does like three or four different genres with white box D and D. Mm-hmm. And they just I played Guardians. That was that's a Night Owl Workshop game. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they just twist it around until it would they basically if if they can't figure out how to do it, they just get a bigger hammer. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. I'm, and it works. Yeah. I'm looking at I'm looking at the Night Owl Workshop website right now. Let's see. Yes, they've they're I've doing exactly they've done John things. Carter. They've yeah. done uh, they've done Starship, Starship Troopers. Troopers. Yep. Starship Troopers. Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah, Guardians, Supers, like you said, yes. And my favorite freebooters. They did yeah. pirates. Pirates, exactly. So yeah, I mean sounds like you could also turn around and shoehorn any of this into the uh um rift system for the palladium system for rifts and do the same kind of thing and have more interesting game world subsections and sections than what rifts did. Or mm-hmm. if, if you, you want, want to. You can or just... if you want to move over to the the Savage Worlds version of Rifts, you have even more worlds. Yep. Oh yeah. Yeah, they yeah. just came out with uh, their version. They, they even called it Nighthawks, but it's it's basically uh, Starship Combat. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I'm just like, wow. Yeah, these yeah, guys wow. have been busy. <laughs> and their two little Beasties books is really good monsters. Mm-hmm. I mean, so uh, the second one's like variations on Trolls and Goblins and stuff, but they're very interesting variations. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it sounds uh, like it. Yeah, they and... See, they do some things that some companies don't. Some companies do where they're. It's like it's kind of like the. I think of it as the Palladium mm-hmm. thing because they will do like, okay, here's beasties, here's all these D and D monsters or these, you know, our OSR monsters. But then in the mm-hmm. back of the book, they'll throw in tables and miscellaneous tables and other stuff. Right. So you get the monsters and you get all this other like. Here's a. Here's a. Uh, a world. Here's a dungeon we created. This floating dungeon. I'll put it at the back of the book. Here's a a list of things that uh, can start your campaign. I'll put it in the back of the book. It has nothing to do with it because mm-hmm. Palladium. When I used to follow the Palladium fantasy mm-hmm. books, it's like, okay, here's part of the world, but here's all this other stuff for the game. Yeah, and I love that. Yeah, yeah. You they know, the, they go ahead. Fall the on. only time, the only thing I've really ever had is a downfall or a downside of the Palladium system and and thought process as a whole they're they're good at generating a good mid-range skill level game system that anyone can get their feet wet in and and mm-hmm. join in and play with mm-hmm. but their greatest downside has always been lack of game product as in adventure product mm-hmm. they have yeah, great cool. ideas they have great settings they have great um characters they have great play available but they never back it up with material to play with to play around to play in they they expect the dm to do all the legwork Mm -hmm. either by converting something they want or using what they have and and Mm -hmm. just free forming off of into into the darkness with whatever slice of palladium you're you're messing with whether Mm -hmm. it's fantasy future riffs tmnt anything like that yeah it's always been the burden on the GM to make something to play with in that world, as you opposed know, so, to the people who make product, make product, make product, would, make product, and publish yeah. it to say, here's an adventure. You can modify it, you can turn it around, you can adjust it, but at least give someone the framework to play from, mm-hmm. not just a world to play no, in. No, I agree with you. The only time they really ever I put could. those kind of things in Palladium books was towards the back of their rule books or supplements. Um, I mean, I remember oh. I was going to run a Ninjas... No, excuse me, a uh, Heroes Unlimited campaign. I came up... I basically had to come up with the uh, with the uh, complete premise of the campaign as to why, um, you know, the characters would be part of this superhero group and so forth and so on. 
And yeah, I mean, I had to come up with this whole thing where, um, oh goodness, I was writing this right around the Gulf, the time of the Gulf War. So basically, the Gulf War went bad. Uh, as it turns out, the uh, armies of the, the some of the armies in the Middle Eastern nations were not quite as much of a pushover as the United States thought they were, and all of a sudden they just just completely did. Uh, they played possum on them and then just sprung this whole thing on the military. And now all of a sudden they're in our streets fomenting, you know, terrorism and rebellion. And right. all, then all of a sudden there was some sort of discovery in the, you know, in the deserts of Afghanistan or something like that, where all of a sudden a lot of people were exposed to this alien technology or radiation or something like that which altered their chemistry which allowed them to develop powers so now so now you have your cobra type a competent cobra type let me make that clear a competent cobra type organization with super you know with superheroes or super villains doing these things and now the uh the supposed good guys are playing catch up and you know now they have to assemble these teams to take them on and to try to uh free the world from their their uh imminent tyranny so to speak i think that's what i made it from i mean okay. i wish i still I, i'd play that yeah i know you would next on yeah. Echo's hammer live play <laughs> i wish oh, i could wait uh, yeah ex- hey hey well, hey, I, hey. Could, I could throw up i can throw up a more modern not as modern but more recent equivalent to that would be gerps mm-hmm. gerps was infinite it was infamous for coming up with absolutely fantastic source books mm-hmm. and they still do but it was mm-hmm. always the hey look at this neat thing we made for you mm-hmm. now go off and make your own stuff I yeah, think exactly. I can count on one hand the super supplements, the mm-hmm. horror supplements, mm-hmm. and most of them are adventures anyway. I'm right. talking about adventures here, but mm-hmm. most of them didn't get anything. You got the source book. That's about it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and that's not a bad thing. That's a no. that's a stretch your legs and do some legwork DM environment for mm-hmm. when you are at that stage of DMing. Right. Okay. But yeah. for those who aren't at that stage, the they old need, guys they need want some a little more. Go ahead. Yeah. The, old, the older guys can use a little more heavy lifting mm-hmm. from the company. Yeah, but yeah both, I agree with you 100%. But that, poli- go yeah. ahead. No, uh, my I'm, whole, no, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Glenn. Let's go ahead. I had, well, I had a critique, but go ahead. Oh, that's all right. Uh, the only thing I would make an exception for uh, Palladium is would be TMNT. Mm-hmm. Because it did turn out quite a few supplements. Yes, they that did. That had adventures in them. I've got like mm-hmm. a half a dozen of them. Yeah. yeah. So. But I think it was a case of well, we and <laughs> once, again, once again we bought we paid for the IP. We're going to use it. Yeah, and yeah. they did the same thing with Robotech. They okay. they published mm-hmm. actual adventures for Robotech. Yeah. Of course, Robotech suffers from uh, uh, the uh, brain lock, Dungeons and Dragons, D and D dragons plays horrible, reads great. Hmm. I well, blocked uh, it out of my mind. Well, it was, uh, well, it was the Dragonlance. Dragon yes, Dragon yeah, Dragonlance. They suffer the Dragonlance syndrome of there's a great existing story present, and then they built all their product around that. Yeah. Well, from what I understand, um, Rifts, both Rifts and Robotech, you better be damn dedicated to it. Yeah. Because from what I understand, especially Robotech, is here's the basic game. If you want more rules to actually make it playable you got to buy these other five books yeah that's what the, yeah and that was no you you could play with you can you can play with the basic book you can expand depending on what your taste of robotech was to all the other subsettings and settings and expansions and there then they actually a published a couple actual adventures yep. uh our dm had to go out of his way to our gm had to go out of his way to make sure we were not present for any canonically events <laughs> to make sure we didn't break them because yeah. we wanted to keep the overarching storyline intact. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, yeah, we'd have broke it. Well, yeah. Down in but that, but, in, but in, being willing to take ahead. the break is sometimes what a DM, a GM needs. Well, yeah, I and, agree. And, and to a lesser extent, Rifts was the same way. I mean, I'd walk into Half Price Books and look at the shelf of, like, Rifts supplements, and it would be Boeing. 
Mm-hmm. You yeah, because they were so under, many. under the weight. But you, but yeah. the, it was an ori- it was an original setting. That's why. You and know, yeah. its thing but, was that you had, again, it's it's they had more plot hooks. They had more. Here's an organization, all detailed out. Do what you want with it. Here yeah. is a bunch of NPCs, all detailed out. Do what you want with them. Mm-hmm. And a couple of plot hooks, but very few. You know, Advanced. box text structured adventures with maps. Right. 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 Yeah, so, no, that was. But, but yeah. it's just just the mere fact that they put that much detail into an original product, you can tell where their where their love lied. Exactly. Lay, love lay. Yeah, I oh, agree. Oh yeah, you like to play play uh, you like to play uh, ninjas and super spies or uh, Beyond the Super. And that's nice. We got riffs over here. Yeah. Why don't you it, try that? Yeah, and you can you know basically you can cross pollinate all you want. That was the that was the selling point for. Uh, for Palladium, once they once they broke away from uh, bait and once they broke away from their fantasy RPG, and then they right. went to oh goodness, I can't remember it. I think they, they went to TMNT. Then they just kept going right down the line. And Rift was the last one. Rift yeah. was like the original that CMBA came up with, and along with his cohorts. And I also, I also think of Torg when I think of Rifts too. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. I mean, I I've only seen Torg. I've maybe thumbed through a couple of rule books. I've never had played it because no one no one ever wanted to tackle it. But I, mean, I still I'll, have my Torg die. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, yeah riffs, I would be surprised. The if you didn't. thing of anything, any world, all worlds, and any worlds mm-hmm. combined. Uh, yeah, it, that, actually, that's what turned me off of the game. Mm-hmm. Oh, that they decide to cross pollinate. Yeah, I did not want my chocolate and my peanut butter. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. But there's also something else when it comes to GURPS and it comes to uh, Palladium and stuff like that. That re- that attracts a certain DM that wants to create everything from scratch, and the problem is, well, it's not a problem, but when it comes to the these guys who run those particular systems, and you know, I mean, it, it, the, they have a certain attitude towards D and D players. Oh, you're running something from a module again, really. Uh, do you do you even sit down and do anything original? Do you just run stuff off modules? It's, I'm just like, hey, f you, man. <laughs> you know, sometimes some of us don't have the uh, Ed Greenwood gene that we can create something completely from scratch and just turn around and, and have a uh, RPG system adapt itself to that, or vice versa. You know, exactly. you know. It's not a question of laziness. Maybe it's just a question of, hey, I don't have the time to do it. I mean, back in 1991, when I came up with that uh, Heroes Unlimited campaign, you know, yeah, I had the time. (laughs) You know, I was, what, 22? I was working a full-time job, but I wasn't doing much. Aside from getting with my gaming group, I wasn't doing anything else aside from that. I had the time. I could sit in my room for three, four hours and sit down and say, okay, what happened if the U.S. military got got bushwhacked by a stronger force than what they ran into in real life? And go from there. And all of a sudden, oh, and how do supers come into play later, you know, later on? And so on mm-hmm. and so forth. You know, yeah, I had the time to do that. Being a 51-year-old man with a 5-year-old son and three jobs, I don't have that kind of time anymore. That's right. <laughs> you know, and so yeah, my campaigns, uh, my D and D campaigns, yeah, they rely heavily on the past material that I grew up with, but it's heavily modified by me. That's what I have the time to do, kind of, sorta. And you know, and these kind of guys who have no difficulty. I mean, I I tip my hat to them because yeah, I at one point I could do that. I can't do that anymore. But yeah, don't be arrogant about it. <laughs> That's all I gotta say. You're right. You're absolutely right. But getting back to his original question, yes, getting yes, back to his question, you can, you can take practically any edition, early edition of D and D, and I'm gonna leave it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna. I know you can take. Yes, full on. You're looking at me. Yes, I know you can take third and fourth and fifth edition to to bend them to your will. But yeah. I'm gonna say up to second edition, you can pretty much. It's like playing with play doh. Yeah, I mean. That a lot of these uh, little companies, that's what they they're do. They're taking BX like Mark Hunt took Gangbusters, 
adapted right. it to BX. I mean, I'm reading stuff on Facebook all the time, all the stuff he's posting, which is genius, by the way. You well, know, you like that. You like oh, that stuff. Yeah, I mean, I I give that guy all the credit in the world because he is. He's one of the guys who kept the faith when it came to that game because not a lot of people played it right. when it when it was fresh in what 1983 I think I and to keep the faith with too yeah exactly and <laughs> it, now, it's always been in the back of my mind it's right just, I never right but you, but that's where you that's where your bread is buttered you love that old timey stuff you always have and there's nothing wrong with that and this guy is just a couple levels above that where he's been constantly keeping the faith until he's like, okay. He ran a long running gangbusters campaign and I commend him for that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And he is like all about it. And I'm like, I'm, I'm amazed about all the stuff he's coming up with. Cause I'm like, wow. <laughs> I mean, yeah, sure. You can go into the history of the 1920s and the 1930s and probably go into the forties with gangbusters before you start having possible issues. But, uh -huh. um, but yeah, I mean, the fact that he just said, Hey, if all of these other little gaming companies are taking the mold, BX rules and they're lifting and shifting them for their, their campaign, I can do that too. <laughs> and he did that. And I'm, hey. I'm impressed by what he's done. Well, so does that answer your question, Mike? Does it answer your question? <laughs> we went on a 20-minute tangent about it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mikey. Thanks for calling in. Don't forget to drop us a line here at thacoshammer.com uh, at gmail.com. You've you go. got, you got to remember that part. Yep. Oh, God. <laughs> no. Uh, I, I've made that mistake on my podcast in several episodes. Every time I hear it, I cringe. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but that's what I get for recording at like one o'clock in the morning. <clears throat> <laughs> that's what I post mine. Mm. Um, but anyway, we've got a number two. Yeah, that is four zero five eight zero six zero five five five. Right on. Let us go on to Magic Fingers. Eeny, meeny, chili beanie, the spirits are about to speak. Well, it just so happens that your friend here is only mostly dead. Sounds like a lot of supernatural baloney to me. Supernatural, perhaps. Baloney, perhaps not. Magic Fingers. Magic Fingers, Mordenkind's protection from avians. Yes. Boy, I wish I would have had that when I watched Birdemic. <laughs> or the birds. <laughs> yeah, yeah the pandemic I could shoo them away with coat hangers. There you go. Watch uh, the riff watch the riff tracks live version of that. You will just fall on the floor laughing. I suppose that, that would is, have also expunged Hawk from, you know, season two of Buck Rogers. Yeah, well, well, yeah, I'd give him a save. Because he's a ha he's like ha he's only part avian because they can't fly. <laughs> they didn't have the special effects for that. <laughs> Frodo and Sam died because somebody cast this around him and all the eagles went away. <laughs> yeah, the eagles said, screw this. You're on your own, dudes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and they die of exposure on the exploding top of Mount Doom. Okay. Speaking, speaking of the dude, I hate the effing eagles. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice, Glenn. I see what you did there. <laughs> So this is let's get the, let's get the lowdown on this spell here. All right, Flan, you want to want to do the honors? Moldenkainen's protection from avians, page five hundred and ninety-eight in the volume three Wizard Spell Compendium. Mm -hmm. Bottom left corner, really short paragraph. Abjuration, air, level one, touch spell, verbal somatic material. One casting time, five rounds per level. Affects the creature touched. And there's no saving throw. This is a defensive magic abjuration, which basically yep. just gives you some protection. Mm -hmm. A creature protected by this spell receives special benefit when in combat with avians, totaling no more than 15 hit dice. If more hit dice attack, the spell is negated. So, so you, you can't use it against the rock. Yeah, exactly. I was just about to say that. Because the rock is 18 now, hit dice. <laughs> now, a juvenile rock hatchling, maybe. Yes. I, I wonder if it would work against, like, pterodactyls and pteranodons, as long as they're under 15 hit dice. Yes. Yeah, I would say okay. so. Okay. Avians have a minus two penalty on rolls to hit the protected creature for the duration of the spell. So basically it's just a bonus of 2D armor class. Mm -hmm. That's it. 
Yep. Yep. Material component spell is a feather from any bird wrapped with a strip of tough leather. Mm-hmm. Doesn't say whether it's consumed or not, and it's an uncommon or rare spell. Mm-hmm. I usually go uh, just as a rule of thumb. If it doesn't say that the the material is consumed in the casting, I assume it's not, and yeah, it can be reused. It's a good, one of the things that you just keep around in your pocket, among all the other um, Trojan horse slew of things that just mm-hmm. fall out of wizard's pockets all day long. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, yeah, because there, God only knows there are enough charms and fetishes and things of that nature hanging from a wizard's belt. So, yeah. Um, I like this because, you know, this not all of Morden Kanan's spells are 7th level and, and ultimate power granting, you know, like, you know, Morden Kanan's sword and things like that. Mm-hmm. And the fact that... A lot of these, probably these spells came into play uh, in the World of Greyhawk uh, box set. You know, the one I think the one that came out in like the 70s, or not the 70s, early 80s. Um, and just the fact that all these spells have, you know, minor uses as well as major. I mean, just go, just read that whole section where there are so many you know, Morden Kanan spells, and it's like, wow. <laughs> you know, this is the reason why um, the the Wizard Spell Compendiums and the Priest Spell Compendiums were made after the uh, Encyclopedia Magica. Because, yeah, a lot of these things have wonderful uses for a campaign and should not be so much world-specific. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I, beca- I become a magical falconer and just use that spell so I wouldn't have to wear the glove. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sure that because it's generic enough and really has no specifics or or exclusions specified in it, just avians mm-hmm. and air mm-hmm. and abjuration, that means that this is a thing that you could apply to the gargoyles. You could apply it to harpies if you have a party that's going to be that's true, at says threat avian. for a thing that yep. may be coming from the air. Um on a stretch, you might be able to use it against other things like griffins and yep. uh, uh, manticores, come on, come on, things like come on, that. Come on, say it. Say I'm not going to say dragons, because no, dragons are their own uh, thing. Yeah, Dragons uh, are their own thing. Yep, dragons maybe. dragons are the rule break. Now, it will work against the flying monkeys, so... <laughs> yeah, get you, my pretty... Oh, darn, you've got that up. I can't snatch you now. Or you can or you can tell the Tressum to get lost. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Always tell the trust me, it, 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 fairies. Well, the, again, fairies are like dragons. They have their own thing they are, so they don't count as avians. They count yeah, as true. fae. You're right. You're right. Well, they can, you know, the creatures can go under more than one uh, category. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. So they could be like draconic and fae or avian and or draconic and, and avian, or fey and avian, or whatever. Like you you, you how, the Chinese want, feathered dragons, okay. However, want, <laughs> however the DM wants to play it, you know? Right, right. You know, but it would be interesting if you had all... Well, it's, it, then again, it's not protection. It's not they're going to go away. Yeah, it's just there, it makes it more difficult for them to hit you and harm you. Yeah. And as a level one spell, it's something that a wizard would have access to several of, so it's not just a one-off one-shot for one party member, uh, mm-hmm. as long as you're above third level. Yep. But when, when you're dealing with that low-level party where you only got the one spell... Mm-hmm. Makes sense. <laughs> yeah. You yeah, find the critical it, person to protect. And mm-hmm. it lasts long enough where it's like kind of like the way the cleric does bless before you go into a battle. Yep. Yeah. Yep, that's what ble- that's how bless was supposed to supposed to be done. I mean, I mean, we can st- we can just stretch this out to a couple of different spells like Morden Kane's defense against non magical reptiles and amphibians. You know, so now you're so- covered by covered with snakes, dinosaurs, frogs, and the giant uh, versions of those animals, but not dragons. <laughs> it says so exclusively. I mean, I'm scrolling well, through. It's- since it's avians, uh, that would become real handy if your party is always running into sturges. Or yes, huh? yes, or oh, Aracogra, that would, that would, if they're that, annoying no. you. I, it seems like every other module I run, there's always sturges in it, mm-hmm. and there isn't. I put them in. Well, yeah, well, uh, yeah. Sturges, so, well, sturges are one of those monsters that 
it all depends on die rolls if it's a low level party if if the die rolls go against the party there are a couple of them are going to get drained to death that's just how and it if is the DM is being mean they are undead vampiric sturges uh, i've got those too <laughs> <laughs> see um, i knew you were one of us <laughs> one of us one of us <laughs> i've got i run swords of wizardry they got it in one of their monster books i'll mm. use it yep. sure yeah um, yeah but yeah, the Monday group. It's like every time I run and I see Sturges, it's like I I see this collective groan. Mm-hmm. Oh, not those again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Sturges. Hey, you yeah, guys yeah. ran into him, Hammers of the Duchy. I mean, you guys handled them pretty well. But yeah, I mean, yeah, Sturges can cause a problem for low to mid level parties if they're if they have enough numbers. But yes, oh, this spell fun. would help. Oh, them. they're fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're they fun. fun. Yeah, definitely fun. fun. But uh, all yeah, you need is like thirty of them, and now the spell doesn't work. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> Thirty-one, <laughs> thirty would work. <laughs> Remember, they're one half hit dice apiece. Thirty-one. <laughs> <laughs> there, or, or at least they all would be difficult, except for that one, and then the, that one would go right for the wizard who cast that spell. But no, that's a, that's being that's being vindictive as a yeah, DM. I like the undead <laughs> version. Nothing like a, a sturge with a ghoul touch. Uh, yeah, they just yeah. free, freeze you in place so I can eat in peace. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, this spell has uh, several uh, variations. Ones for avians, ones for slimes, which actually could probably be would help in the murder hall. But yeah. <laughs> you know, it helps blank below a, mm-hmm. tremendously. They have blank below, yes, murder yes. hole, not so much. I don't have that many slimes in the murder hole. Come oh, on, yeah. Uh, they got one for I- insects and arachnids. Which would help a lot, you know, and things like that. Green, I mean, you get those green slimes and cloakers and stuff that tend to drop on you from below, from mm-hmm, above. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you'll be happy to have that spell. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So, you know, it's not just for avians, but yeah, there are various there are variations of this spell which do pretty much the exact same thing. You know, give the affected being a minus two. You know, so it's not so ridiculously powerful that all of a sudden it's like ha ha i can walk through the i can walk through this and night below and none of these slimes can touch me ha ha we are going to win no you're not <laughs> you know but yeah i mean like i said we're going to be doing morden canaan spells for quite some time because a lot of these things are really uh interesting fun. yeah right. fun yeah fun and interesting so you know, and, I and probably course, shouldn't have picked the this. The end-all be-all is that at any given time, two mm-hmm. points of armor class are not to be knocked for mm-hmm. a low-level party who, no, you no, know, doesn't no. have the wherewithal to get the good stuff anyway yet. Mm-hmm. So, no, you're right. Make the spell do it for you. Mm-hmm. No problem. The, the uh, you know, wizards would be happy to have that and bracers of defense. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. You know, you know them and the thief. <laughs> There's always yeah. competition between the wizard and the thief who gets the first set of bracers, the first... Oh, uh, well, there's no, those ring no of argument. I, 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 yeah. Well, I wouldn't make it the wizard every time because at least the thief can have leather armor. Mm-hmm. And put it on the halfling and the gnome. They're the only ones he- light enough to be carried off. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> All of a sudden, they become slippery. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they can't grab them. Yep. <laughs> like the gre- like, it's like a greased pig. I yeah. can't do this. Uh, <laughs> So, anyway, that's Mordenkainen's Protection from Avians. Mm-hmm. Look and it up and tell us about it. They go to and all that other good stuff. Let us go on to Snipe Hunt. If you only had a living brain. What do you think, escape gorilla? Listen, you're making enough noise to wake up the dead. I don't have to wake him up. He's up. It's time for a Snipe Hunt. And we have another snipe hunt. We're really going to be going through lycanthropes now, folks. We're going to start on the bottom with a were rat. Yep, the were rat. And it's like that it's like you know, they're nice, but I tend to run giant rats instead. Mhm. Oh, well, I Just, tend if I'm going to go if I'm going to go that far, I'm I'll run giant rats with a were rat controlling them. That's what I'll go. do. You yeah. know. I mean, for a really low-level party, but the problem is, is that 
with regular rats, they have that one percent chance of inflicting a disease, or five per, excuse me, five percent chance, mm-hmm. just by being bit by a giant rat, which is rough. Then all of a sudden, you got to fight the weir rat, which can turn you into a weir rat by inflicting damage on you, and that's not good. You know, no, no. I mean, I was just for uh, just for information's sake, I was looking because you put the thought in my head earlier when we were, you know, BSing uh, Glenn about Van Richten's. Of course, Mm -hmm. they have a Van Richten's Guide to Weir Beasts. (laughs) And yeah, just off the top. I mean, let me I mean, with with uh, most lycanthropes, every point of damage they inflict is one a one percent chance that you will be inflicted with lycanthropy, which is one of the reasons why I don't use lycanthropes that much. Right. Um, but uh, in with you're in Ravenloft, that one percent becomes two percent. <laughs> well, I've got I've got the like I said, I had the Van Richten's guides, which is like all of them compiled into one, mm-hmm. and, and the Were Beast chapter is in there. But another, there's two good sources for lycanthrope. Mm-hmm. And one's in Basic D&D and one's in 2nd Edition. Yes. The Van Richten's Guide is the 2nd Edition. In Basic D&D, if you can find the Creature Crucible, Night Howlers. Yes, Night Howlers, yep. Yeah. Yeah, they go That's into... a great, great resource. For yeah, that. they go into really good detail about uh, the various lycanthropes. Okay, but the Weir Rat in particular, let's just run down the uh, stats real quick. Um, let's see... Uh, let's see, they have a nocturnal activity cycle, which makes sense. They have a pack organization. They're scavengers. Uh, Mm -hmm. But they have a very high intelligence, 11 or 12. That is very high intelligence. So you have to run them as such. They're not stupid. Uh, They're lawful evil. A little bit above average. A little bit above average. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, That's That's why they run as packs, and they're often part of or infiltrating in or infecting thieves guilds because yep. they are part of the guild they are yep. part of the work yep exactly well any uh really good uh guild master will have we rats on retainer because yeah they will they will do some of the dirty work that's maybe some of their other thieves won't um right. let's see the number appearing is four to twenty four Armor class 6, movement rate 12, 3 plus 1 hit dice, uh, Thacko 17, uh, 1 attack per round, but they don't, they use weapons most of the time, and of course they attack by surprise. Um, and of course the main uh, theme throughout this uh, iterate, these this run of snipe hunts we're going to do, where rats can only be hit by silver or plus 1 or better weapons. So yeah, that's that's the thing. Um, let's see. Of course, most lycanthropes can transform into three forms. Human form, their human-sized uh, bipedal form, and their animal form. In this case, rats. Um, they usually... Well, Go ahead. giant rat. Giant rats, like, sorry. Giant rat, two feet long from nose to rump. Yep, and exactly. Plus tail on top of that. And True. the uh, interesting thing is that their mm-hmm. weapon, or their damage is by weapon in all three forms. Mm-hmm. So if you've got a large rat using a short sword, mm-hmm. you're probably not wanting to get stuck by that. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yep, because there it is. There's that 1% chance per point of damage of becoming a wear rat every time they get hit. So, yes. Now, I have seen... Some DMs who take the damage there's taken in combat and just add it all together, make it one roll, but it turns out to be however much damage is done. I don't do that. <laughs> I would much rather, if you get hit in the combat for three points of damage, there, and I have you roll personal dice, that's for that time. Then if you get hit again for four points, then you roll for that time. I've known some DMs who take pleasure in adding all that up and all of a sudden now it's a legitimately scary, say, 15 to 20 percent chance that you get inflicted with lycanthropy. And I'm just like, that's not that's not nice. <laughs> I won't go so far as to say it's unfair, although it's pretty close. But yeah, um, also we rats pre- uh, prefer to attack from ambush. Um, they will, one, they will assume human shape and try to lure unsuspecting victims into a trap. 
and usually this is the only time you will see a solitary weir rat. But his, uh, but his or her cohorts are close by, and they're going to jump you <laughs> if right. you decide to try to offer help. Um, the victims are then robbed, held for ransom, or eaten. <laughs> You know, and then all of a sudden there's that percentage chance of becoming one of them. You know, um, but yes, each were rat can summon and control two to 12 giant rats. That's important. <laughs> so, yeah, it, a weir rat lair is, yeah, that's going to be pretty nasty. <laughs> so, um, in, se- in several varieties of ways. Go ahead. No, just, just just going on with that, the, the where rat lairs are going to be nasty places. Yes. And again, there's different results of the interbreeding, whether it's with um, human males or human females, as yep. far as the results of what they get mm-hmm. as an offspring result and how they spread their disease when it's not by um, the damage they do. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I'm seeing that. That's that's pretty crazy. Yeah, that it, it all depends on the actual genders of the uh, beings involved. But yeah, that's that's pretty interesting. Um, let's see. Yeah, they they usually dwell in subterranean lairs, uh, hidden among sewers and catacombs beneath cities. You know, and that's one of the reasons why it's always good to have them in good with the thieves guild. Um, because and they are the thieves guild. Yeah. Well, yeah, their own particular. Yes. You know, and it's pretty. Yeah. So and. <laughs> And anytime I start hearing things about sewers and stuff, then I start hearing, remembering all the stuff Corey used to talk about <laughs> when he was running his campaign and about how a, and a, a mid-level adventuring party would get completely wrecked just going down mm-hmm. into the sewers, <laughs> you know. And it's not even the what they would go up against; it's the sewers themselves, you know. Right. You know, yeah, because sewers are nasty and disgusting, and yeah, there's a reason why that, they're underground. That's not even going in for the Ratmen or the Skaven if people really want to get horrible things imported mm-hmm. into their campaigns. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've got, well, I've got one that's even, they'll go you one better, because uh, I'm going from the uh, Monstrous Collection, which has the Weir Rat Lord. So... If you really want to get interesting and get and have this have these weir rats be an actual power, check this out. Um, okay, just as the weir rat, they're scavengers, nocturnal pack organization, that kind of thing. They're chaotic, evil in alignment. Their intelligence runs from high to genius. Um, there are they start with weir, weir rat level statistics, armor class, hit dice, but they go up and. You know, they end up having like uh, probably uh, class. Yeah, they have class levels, and so now you've got like a master thief, weir rat lord, who's like a twelfth level thief or a thirteenth level thief. You know, and he's got the stats of one along with the stealth, along with the stealth things. Um, most of the times, uh, the weir rat lords are thieves, seventy-five percent. They can be mages ten percent of the time, and mage thieves five percent of the time. Or now think of that, um, yeah. So the the and they also uh, their hit dice and class level advance at the same rate. So yes, a sixteenth level human weir rat lord thief would attack attack as a sixteenth level rogue in human form and as a sixteen die hit monster in man rat form. <laughs> so yes, that so th- then there's that, and of course you the know, Thacko as a not... weir as a man rat is much better. <laughs> Uh, what, 16 w- hit dice, not... what, Thacko of, like, what, Ooh. three? <laughs> I would not I would not hold to the chaotic evil alignment. Mm-hmm. I would push it more towards lawful evil, because mm-hmm. imagine if they, he's got a, if he's if they have an organization, thieves, or other were-rats that are following him, mm-hmm. and they're all lawful evil, mm-hmm. and he's chaotic evil, there's mm-hmm. going to be some friction there. Mm-hmm. Because Perhaps. they're gonna, because they're all going to start thinking, oh, we're smarter than this guy. He just does what he wants. Oh no, oh, that that's that's part of the whole um, power balance of the system, where you have something so powerful that does what he wants is the thing in charge. There's an organization beneath him that's actually smart. organized and structured and smart, but op- is Obedient. subject to the pack mm-hmm. mentality. Yep. So he's doing the alpha thing, and they're subject to the yeah. pack mentality. That's why they it's okay. An, it's another way but, of, of of 
ruling through fear and intimidation. Yes. When, you, when you go into the, they're this powerful, and there's a whole bunch of them, and they're this powerful, that's where you get into the Skaven problem. And the downside of Skaven is that, well, they will, inf- you know, you will end up with most of them dealing with their own problems, and they don't organize well, other mm-hmm. than just by breeding them way into overwhelming everyone. Mm-hmm. So uh, you, you don't want a whole pack of lawful evil were rat lords regular <laughs> were rats that are lawful evil they're down the totem pole far enough that they are an achievable overcomable threat even when they're organized in a pack of two, of 4 to 24 as opposed to a were rat lord at 15 16 12 whatever hit dice plus mm-hmm. all of his minions plus all of his other things that's yep. where you're talking about the bbeg of a campaign mm-hmm. target as opposed to and you know we've got 15 of them and they are the generals of the uh, um, secret police. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Well, I would also, as a, as, a, as, a, as a game master, I would probably give them a weakness uh, two times damage when fighting. They would get two times damage when fighting a magical nutcracker. What? Okay, explain that's that joke. My, that's, that's a joke for my British friends out there. Okay, because, yeah, that, that one went right over my head. I am King Rat! <laughs> you say that and you haven't watched Tanya the Evil yet. I'm just going to laugh when you do. Okay. Okay. I'll look, I look forward to that once I can get look a... At, look at the, look at the Nutcracker. Look at the Nutcracker sometime. Okay. The that... big bad guy is King Rat. Oh, you mean the Nutcracker suite as in... Okay. Yeah, got the, it, got the it, got ballet it. and all that. Okay, okay. It's... It, it, it's just so like much said, a part of Christmas, I don't even think about it anymore. But, like, okay. like I said, that joke was for my British friends. Out okay, there. <laughs> fair enough. Uh, let's Glenn, see. it's for you. <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay, this might explain why their uh, why their chaotic evil and uh, this ex- pretty much goes in line with what Fulon came up with. Uh, we're rat lords or parasites on the parasites. Not only do they feed off humankind and steal their riches, they use their own common kind to do it. Like cuckoos, like cuckoos, they infest the lair of a clan of weir rats or a thieves' guild to provide themselves with a comfortable nest to live in. While initially beneficial, this usually spells doom for the host in question. The lords are only interested in themselves and think nothing of sacrificing their followers to protect their own miserable hides. Oh yeah. Yeah. So yeah, he's like the the you know, the one who's always ex- you know they're always expending weir rat soldiers to expand their own power base, you know, and while the lower level weir rats can't, don't like it, there's very little they can do about it because if you are a three plus one hit die weir rat and you try to challenge your weir rat lord who's basically a 14th level thief, all he has to do is change into rat man form and you're meat. You're done. <laughs> because he attacks a 14 hit dice creature with like a back of five. <laughs> said, did the I- said did the Irish. They cost nothing. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> now that one I understood. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Send in the Irish. <laughs> yeah, good yeah. old long shanks. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, old, so. Old McGowan. So, yeah, I mean, like Fulon said, this is a. I could see this being, like, a goal of a city. Like, the party is sent to, like, this almost completely... I could almost see this being a paladin role, sending him and his cohorts to the city and saying, clean it up. (laughs) Because evil has completely overrun the city. The normal uh, people, you know, the normal people who are just trying to live day to day, they're being harassed, beaten up, killed... Uh, converted to weir rats, think that kind of stuff, and now charge the party with trying to find out what's going on here and deal with it. You know, I could see that. And going up against a weir rat lord is not going to be easy, but not by any any uh, means. So you know, right. you know, I thought that was an interesting addition to the weir rat. That's one of the reasons why I love the monstrous collection so much because all this kind of stuff is collated. <laughs> so you look Monster, at this and you see that monstrous collection, monstrous collection. Yes. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, gotcha, gotcha. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, if you like the weir rat as we do, mm-hmm. give us a, <laughs> drop us a line at thecosaver at gmail dot com. 
So we are now going to, this has been a long time coming, get into a brainstorm. Yes. Now you tell me what you know. Only the infinity of the depths of a man's mind can really tell the story. What are you, a wizard, a genius? DM Brainstorm. Okay, DM Brainstorm. When was the last time we did one of these? That I can't, was, I can't give, give me two seconds to figure it out. We are in what, 167? Oh, not 163. 163. Uh, let me scroll over. Well, I was speaking hypothetically. But... Well, yeah, let's see. Well, that was 163, 163, 160, as a matter of fact, when we did Fulon's wonderful little Staff of True Life episode. That's right. Yeah, that's the last one. So we today did. we're going to do a monk's monastery. Yes, we are. And just talking about were rats, we ought to add some of that in there. Mm-hmm. I was just reading an adventure in one of the in the uh, Basic Fantasy Adventure Compendium Two, which mm-hmm. they are very good, by the way, for any system. They write some really good adventures. Something about a monastery that, unbeknownst to the acolytes, the the head of the monastery is evil, who puts up a good front of good. Mm-hmm. And blah 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 blah, you know. But anyway, I digress. We got a monk's monastery. Where are we yep. going to stick it? Well, it has to be somewhere secluded. I want to. You know, I would say like a plateau, like in like a put small a mountain range in put the dungeon. In a su- no, put it in the sewers. <laughs> secluded. Yeah, let me. Yeah, let me duke it out with the weir rats. Why not? There we go. <laughs> um. We're talking mountaintops. Oh, you uh, want to know desert, something? Desert away, underground desert oasis. What? What? Okay, I just had a thought. What? Um, because even in the uh, first edition player's handbook, where the monk uh, class was originally uh, put, or at least brought to my attention when I first started playing, you know, they even said when they talk about you know the hierarchy of a monastery. You know, now, of course, in second edition or in AD&D in general, monks have to have a lawful alignment, uh, whether it be lawful good, lawful neutral or lawful evil. Most monasteries I've ever seen, or at least from players, most of them like to run either one of two things. They either like to run like a mishmash of all three alignments in one monastery or they segregate them, you know, like or at least... Like uh, with a kind of like the wizards of Dragonlance, where you have your your red robes, your your black robes, and, and your, your white your robes. white robes. Exactly, exactly. So I was thinking we could probably set that we could probably uh, stre- not stretch it out, but we'd probably come back to this uh, later on, and like we could do like a like a Shaolin type this time, and then come back and do like a you know uh, like a. Oh goodness! I can't even think of like a a, a sec, but like a real, you know, like a lawful evil uh, monastery. No, I'm, I'm saying we start with the lawful evil Shaolin, and we go with this is a uh, rat right. men wear rat monastery of rat who <laughs> Shaolin in uh, the middle of the shogunate, who are the leaders of the resistance uh, and the the secret spies, who are like the bane of samurai and the ninja mm. i take back what i said about the were rats being no no see no. see see <laughs> see see this is the you 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 give you give this man an inch he will go 10 miles not just one anyway um but see. anyway <laughs> you see and it's a lawful see. evil monk okay organization uh, so okay. we can go I we can go, go mean with it mm-hmm. yeah we could uh, be oh. well okay okay well, I'm willing to entertain it full on because you want to know what, you know, I don't have a problem with it. There are a couple of uh, Dragon Dragon Magazine articles about monasteries, um, including one about, you know, the different, how three different uh, monasteries operate. Like there's one who's like, you know, the ones who, you know, gather knowledge and save it for the benefit of of all around them then there's the ones who are the uh they infiltrate a city and they get their leadership hooked on black lotus powder or black lotus dust or black lotus juice whatever it is and get them hey. addicted to it and then that riches that enables 
or excuse me, enriches the monastery and so forth. And then there I think are, we can fit all three in here. Yeah, that we, way can... we also get to bend on our uh, protection from avians uh, spellcraft, <laughs> which the uh, monks of the Rat Temple uh, uh... used to protect against those. Uh, um, avian <laughs> eagle claw fu- kung fu practicing monks of the good temple. Stop, full on, stop. <laughs> Just, oh no. Stop, stop, <laughs> stop. This is not where I wanted to take this. Eagle, <laughs> I didn't want to. Eel style, crane style. Yep, yeah, yeah, crane style, eagle style, hawk style. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I could see that. But anyway, okay. All right, let's 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 just start with one. Let's start with one. Now, Fulon wants to Fulon wants to start with the evil one, and that one is going to be at least the way I see it. They are a they are semi secluded, but more of a hiding in plain sight kind of uh, place. They would they they would actually go in, they would actually go into in search of the or excuse me uh in search of the unknown not in search of the unknown they would take that complex over too they would go into the caves of chaos and completely wipe it out maybe they'd spare the orcs if they decided to subjugate themselves to the will of the monks maybe but and then they would probably start <laughs> training orcs in martial arts there there's go, a Mark. frightening st- there's a frightening <laughs> thought there you go brian uh-huh <laughs> the Black Monastery, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, okay. They got a whole thing on about good monk, bad monks. I need, I need that supplement. Monks. I've been trying, I've been, tr- I've been trying to get st- to stat out my my monk factions for gears, and every time I start doing it, my brain just completely locks up. You know, I, me I even watched 36 show. Chambers of Shaolin as an inspiration, and my brain still goes. <laughs> so go ahead. Mind me after the show. Okay, done. Done and done. Um, okay, so I could see. I could see, like, a lawful evil uh, section, you know, sect of monks uh, taking over a former lair of monsters, clear, cleaning it out, or even using the monsters that subjugate themselves to them as a front so that if an adventuring party calls and they start beating up on those denizens all of a sudden out of from out of nowhere you see these shaven headed human beings in black robes with uh hand wraps you know, hand wraps and hand guards and shin guards and stuff like that. And they have, and it looks like they're in these weird dancing poses. That's how I would do it to a novice party. <laughs> um, I mean, the original inspiration was uh, uh, against the cult of the reptile god. When you go up against three monks in this one particular area. <laughs> and yeah, that boggled the party that got that far in that adventure. But anyway. You, uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I'll just make it. I'll ahead. just make him the Wing Kong. The Wing. Kong. <laughs> oh, I get it. Never mind. <laughs> yellow took... turbans are anyone? Huh? What's that, yeah. Fulon? Yellow, yellow turbans, anyone? Shang Tsung versus the Wing Kong. There we go. <laughs> okay. So I mean, I could see like a like I said, it, they're just a front. In the semi-secluded area, I could see them, ha- you know, basically just completely, in- not enslaving, but, you know, basically saying, this is what you're going to do for us. If you don't, we will just destroy you and be done with you, you know, as a, a lawful evil join us or die kind of thing would go. Uh, go we just, uh, we, uh, we desire a sacrifice mm-hmm. every year. Yeah. You I'm are a girl with green eyes. No, yeah. no, uh, something else. They, uh, they do, they do the uh, poppy farming and the mush and the special mushroom farming. Oh, there you go. Yep. And who knows? And who they, knows? they are, they are the, they are the conduit for the illicit substances that are the things that, need to be cracked down on Mm -hmm. and they probably run secret opium dens in town yes that's how they that's how they get in and corrupt the various uh towns and cities especially work for the british yeah of course it worked for the british you know the british are we make this a port town which is kind of shanghai-ish so we have we have the 
you have the sewers and the city, and then you have the extended dock works with mm-hmm. things built out over the water. Okay. And so you have underwater access, you have below the docks access, like Lake Town. Mm-hmm. And yeah. then you have the buildings and structures there. Okay, full on the sewer and all the swimming rats. Full on, I'm putting, I'm throwing down the gauntlet. Draw that. (laughs) Draw that. You you did that. You did that jungle port so well. I want I want a I want a drawing of that because yeah, I'm seeing that. that. I gotta find that again. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm ready to put it in my campaign. Yeah, yeah, wasn't that good? And that's and that's like ninety percent his idea. <laughs> we just floated out the the brainstorm and he ran with. I've it. got yeah, I've got a swamp area in my world that that would fit in perfectly. Yeah, it, yeah, that was awesome. Okay, let's let's break off of that for a moment, um, because yeah, now let's we keep... have the that we have structured. Let's go to the lawful neutral ones. Now those. They're in that same dragon article, the lawful neutral sect of, of the mo- uh-huh. of the monks, they just were called the lawgivers. They would go into uh, chaotic areas and bring law to them. Now, you know, whether by instruction or whether by fist, it almost didn't matter. You know, right. they were the ones who went to the barbarian lands and, you know, either through pacification or subjugation. Um, they, uh, they would bring order to a, to a land that was just, no, just chaos. And whether, whether that was a good or a bad thing almost didn't matter to them, you know, being lawful neutral because the rules is the rules is the rules to lawful right. neutral guys. Um, to them, I could see them it just keeps ha- the balance. Yes. Yeah. Well, it, it, yeah, if it's a completely lawless area where it's a dangerous place for caravans to go and the bandits are just running amok and then there are yeah. various uh, barbarian tribes who are, instead of trying to uh, subsist on the land that they live upon, they're always raiding other civilized areas and always trying to destroy them and taking slaves and this kind of and that kind of stuff i could see that you know that would be their mission yeah. you know i mean i can see ahead. those guys giving the pcs the job of cleaning out the slavers in the slavers modules mm-hmm. yeah i could see that stop stopping the slavers well the problem is is then there that's one of the major trades of the lawful evil mo- uh, monk organization there's another facet I mean, of the story you mm-hmm. can play <laughs> yeah i mean yeah, yeah that's that's the scarlet brotherhood and Greyhawk. that's that's what they all do i mean aside from them being um fascist uh What's that word? Uh, what's that term for people who believe in their own superiority over everyone else? Exactly. That's what I was trying to think of. Yeah, I couldn't think of the word. You used it earlier in the podcast. I can't remember. But yeah, so you know, that's what the Scarlet Brotherhood did. They did everything to further their own power through, you know, bribery, intimidation, slavery outright making war on other nations and things like that okay almost superior yes yeah <laughs> and and with the with the evil sect of monks being led by or or thoroughly infested by the were rats they're the ones who are doing all that corrupt stuff and they are the spies mm-hmm. and they are the mm-hmm. agents of chaos and they are the the slave traders and the drug traders where mm-hmm. you have the neutral faction which is the you know, the lawful neutral faction, which is all about the order, all about the order, all about the order. So mm-hmm. we have your your lizard men, dragon men, dragon style monks mm-hmm. who are contracted for escort missions and for uh, keeping the peace and uh, you know dealing with the 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 local um, government structures that try to come right. in and, and impose order. And they're all about the order. Mm-hmm. So they're the they're they are like that. Yeah. So and okay, so now we have the one who are always trying to corrupt and destroy. Then you have the ones who are trying to maintain order, and those two factions do come into conflict a lot. And usually those battles are epic <laughs> because so, you mind have you that they're not necessarily good. No, they they're are, not. They are. They are 
order and structure and and law over all else. Yes. Yes. And well, then a, go ahead. Go ahead, Mark know, line. No, no, I'm just imagining a battle here of the good ones versus the bad ones with the neutral one throwing in as a wild card. Yeah, they can go Whoever. either way. Yeah. That yeah, they can go either way. It all depends. Um but yeah, the lawful good one, you know, all uh, and this is this is a direct result of me watching way too many Wuxia films when I was, oh God, starting when I was like, what? Oh, da, 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 seven, eight years old, nine years old, all the way, all the way to the present day. Cause you know, I've got a, I follow a, a thing on a uh, Facebook, not Facebook on Instagram where they show, you know, wow. the classic movies and you know, there are just so many, you know, things about the Shaolin monks that's always stuck in my head now this faction and the funny part is is that all of the these three factions they all used to be part of the same set okay <laughs> okay full-on gotcha um they all you all used to be part of the same sect but they split off hundreds of years ago and this is the result of that where each faction was not interfering with the other and they all grew in their separate ways i mean it's sort of like an atari symbol where it starts all the same uh line up top but then as it comes down the two the middle one goes straight down and the other two branch out in different directions (laughs) so i mean i that's what i'm seeing here the lawful good uh sect would be um of course looking out for the depredations of the <laughs> stop full on you're breaking my train of thought here stop that um breaking i mean uh looking out and trying to de- uh, either counter or eliminate the depredations of the lawful evil faction they've been at odds for centuries which is one of the reasons why the temple the main temple splintered away hundreds of years ago just too much conflict there um and, of course, the lawful neutral ones, they feel like they are the ones who uh, stuck to the tenets of the original uh, monastery the, all those hundreds of years. But the problem is, sort of like the Jedi in the prequels, their, sort of their message got a little uh, muddied and clouded to where mm-hmm. it wasn't, it was about keeping order, but their ways and methods of keeping order are going a little too almost too far afield but which is why they don't help out with the lawful evil fact faction as much they're too hidebound in their rules that's the that's the problem and the lawful evil i mean the lawful good faction there are they're your shaolin monks they're the ones that wander the world they're the ones that uh look for Uh, signs of corruption from lawful evil faction and are dedicated to eradicating it. You know, they're the ones who will educate uh, the populace. They're the ones who will Mm -hmm. take in the people and beings that are strong enough in body, body, mind, and spirit to be able to undergo their training and go through their training and become monks of the sect. That's how they get there. Maybe. Since they're neutral, they let the uh, acolyte decide at the end. Mm-hmm. That's how it was in the beginning. Since the, they're yeah. neutral. Yeah, yeah. That's how it was in the beginning when the when they were all it was an all inclusive monastery, but too many issues through the years. Um yeah, the lawful good sect. Oh, I was talking about the neutrals. Oh the new okay. Well, let's let's Go ahead, say Paul. this then. The the um, lawful good sect is the one who is actually, uh, because of the schism, they are the ones who have no house. They have no home. They mm-hmm. are the true wandering monks out and about in the world, and mm-hmm. they are the little glimmers of light. Mm-hmm. The um, neutral ones retained the actual location, the, the temple, okay. the original the, temple. The main they, temple, They yes. held it because, mm-hmm. you know, Neutrals the break even, and they outnumber everybody. So they yep. um, held the structure by law uh, alone and order, mm-hmm. and, and you know, devoting everything to structure. And it's like the people who 
can still show up and try to get trained are are immersed into the lawful ways of monkdom and mm-hmm. they either uh get fed up and descend into darkness and get abducted away by the ratmen or they uh, become enlightened and say that there's more to life than law and the the goodness of others are needed to be espoused and they get scooped up and wander off with some uh um robe somewhere out and about Okay. trying to do good in the world whereas the structured lawful you know organizers of you know we train we train this is the way this is the way this is the way that's all the way is mm-hmm. are are the ones who are you know doing the the grunt work of the the escort missions and the the guardsmen mm-hmm. and the things like that to the exclusion of all else trying clinging to law to, above to hold it above the chaos right okay so basically what you're saying is, is that that all that most of the potential monks that come into the that want to go into the sect, they go to the lawful neutral sect first and they go to the lawful sect the like lawful neutral sect first and they pretty much through their training and through the disciplines that they're instilled with, they figure out who you know what more or less side they're on. And the you know the ones that are about the law and the, the believe in nothing but the law, the law itself, they're the ones who stay with they they stay with the main the, with the main sect, and the splinter sects on either side, they you know they basically leave that monastery and go, you know and go out to the splinter temples either way and join up with those two sects. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. Good, good, good. Okay, I'm a, I'm I'm with that. I like that. As a matter of fact, I like that a lot. All right. And this gets this gets Glenn his t- his temple on the uh, on the mount again. Yeah. Yeah. The temple. Oh, I got your back. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Again, where are these located? Okay. Where shall we? Are we three different places, or are they yeah. like three three different areas of the same town, or? Well, okay. No. The the main. I would like I said the main. Uh, the main uh, temple of the lawful evil sect, they would just be in a place where all three of them are difficult to get to because that's the initial part of the training. You know, right. you know, almost Jedi-like in that way, is that first you've got to be able to have the, the gumption to find these places. You know, that's the first thing. you got to be tough enough to go up way high in the mountains where the lawful good one is. You've got to actually uh, look and find the, uh, you know, find the areas where the lawful neutral one, the lawful neutral one, of course, by default, if we're using that model full on said, would be the easiest one to find. You know, it's still, it's still on the remote side, but not really. You know, basically, no one goes there unless they're willing to learn. That's pretty much that's the whole thing, because and are accepted and are and definitely accepted. You know, and to even, the cruel tutelage of Pai Mei. Yes, Pai Mei was lawful evil all the way. That is like the. I don't know if lawful neutral. No, he was not lawful neutral. He was not. He was not. I will argue that until the day I die, because the way he was in kill. I'm using the Kill Bill example. Because when he, the way he was in Kill Bill, he was lawful evil all the way. That's how he was allied with Bill, because Bill's lawful evil. He was, he was just a nasty mofo, you know? I mean, he basically said it at the end of the second part. I'm a killer. You know that, you know? I mean, to get off on a little bit of a tangent, I mean, the Kill Bill movies are about a, an assassin who was more or less neutral evil, but had an alignment change when she found out she was pregnant by her lawful evil boss. That's what that's about. And then they found out that uh, she decided to leave them and go marry a regular dude, and they go, jump in on them at, at, at the wedding and kill him and kill everybody else and beat the ever-loving snot out of her, and then put a bullet in her head thinking to kill her and that's the way that whole thing starts but that's just the the dm in me <laughs> i will leave that where it is um okay um the yeah, yeah i agree with you you know the temple on you know the temple on the you know on the mountain or in 
the mountains where it's just really rough going. I mean, I'm thinking about how uh, Sam and Frodo were going through to try to get to Mount Doom before uh, Gollum came along, and they're just going through mountains and swamps and going in circles and not knowing where they are. Um, you know, that's how I figure it, how hard it is to get to the lawful neutral temple. And from that point forward, um, that temple does have a representative from both of the other splinter temples there, because that's how one of the reasons how they find out where the, a particular acolyte's leanings are going to be. You know, and that's the th they'll call them the three high masters, and then they have their lesser monks beneath them. That's the, the hierarchy. Lawful, the lawful neutral mm -hmm. um, monastery could be a um, neutral ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I would say so. The, the, both the good and the evil can come there. Yeah. yeah. They just have to behave themselves. Yes, they do. And that's how they... they they advance that's why in the, level. That's why, the, that's why the dragon men maintained the temple and control and maintained the control of it because mm -hmm. they've got the the law on their side, and that is what the whole progression of everything is done by the strict order, by the way, by the way, by the way, mm -hmm. and that's also where they do their you know it's progression almost, advancement duels. Yes, it's that's what like I was a, getting to. It's almost like a monk like embassy. Yes, I could see that. I, as a matter of fact, when I first started playing D&D uh, &D and we started messing around with the ideas of, of uh, monasteries, that's how it was. You had, you know, uh, a lawful good 21st level abbot who ran, over, ran the thing. Then under him, you had uh, like a 12th, uh, like not 12th, uh, like a 14th level or 15th level Lawful neutral, lawful good, lawful evil, uh, chief, you know, uh, second in you know, second in commands, and they formed a council as to the directions and the day to day operations of the monastery. Uh -huh. That's just how that all came out. That's that's the way I I did it when I was a kid. That's what I saw. But as I've gotten older, I'm like, okay, maybe over here this is one, maybe over here this is another. But I like how full on combined the three. You know, I, I so love how he did that. So you got one down in the sewers, you got one on the mount, and mm -hmm. the neutral is under a uh, shirt laundry? <laughs> I could use, no, I could say an ancient Chinese no, the, secret the, joke, the, but I won't. The good, ones are, the good ones are just straight up homeless. They, they uh, are, are just out and about doing the live by example and do good works thing, and that mm -hmm. means they're busy. Yeah. And uh, well, also, yeah. they, were, they were driven out. And so they are they out trying something. so if to they need use something, the works of the. They need, okay, so they need if they need something, they can always, always go to the neutral temple. Yeah, they, that's yeah. They can go back there. That's where they conduct their uh, their duels and you know their promotions they, and things have, like that. Yeah, yes. they may have a like, you know, a, a, oh, like a community center who rents out a room or something like that mm -hmm. for a certain event. Mm -hmm. that kind of thing they could mm -hmm. say okay we need to just we need to take care of some stuff mm -hmm. so could we borrow a room in your temple to yeah. do that i could see them actually the having... evil ones probably do the same thing oh, yeah they'd have the... we'll but... see this is the whole this is what comes down to it this is why all of you know monks once they advance to a certain level now with my campaign you don't have to worry about duels until your 12th level you know, by the book, it's like, I think it's like, what, eighth? I think it is start having to duel at so eighth fun. level and up. And the thing is, is that in the three, you know, in the main temple, and you have the three factions there, if you are a lawful good monk, you're basically, all you're doing is sparring to touches. That's all you're doing. If you do touches, a certain number of touches, um, you know, the monk is defeated and the monk is promoted above him. Uh, the the lawful neutral right. one is full contact. Whoever's knocked unconscious first loses, and that right. monk is promoted. The third one is to the death. The strong right. only the strong survive. So if you're going to be promoted in that one, you are going to fight, and you are going to fight until one of you die, and that's how that works. Um, three rings hold it. Okay, I can see that because there has full on just came. 
uh, speak on that, Fawn, please. That'll work. So we, we take this and we make them have the access, the, the temple structure that was um, fought over and then the, the various people cast out or walked out was originally the uh, three caldera rings of a volcanic mountain range structure. So they've got access to the hot springs. They got access to weird elevations and structures. And the three main calderas are the three rings of the temple, which were the training holy grounds of the three orders of the monks, the three sects or the ways of training, Mm -hmm. the three schools of thought. Let's let's call it the schools of thought, the the styles, the dragon style, the eagle style, and the rat style. And (laughs) they... Don't make me make make one. I can do that. I'm making you make them. And then they (laughs) they had their schism, the breakdown, Mm -hmm. the Dragon men seized control of the entire complex. Mm -hmm. The lawful neutral order seized control of the entire complex. They've driven all the others out. Mm -hmm. And uh, the... Of course, the, the rat men went off on their own devices to go make money, make profit, be spies, and do evil works because mm-hmm. they're into that. Yes. The good ones of the Averial Elves and the Eagle Foo went out to go do good works and uh, occasionally you know, aspire to return or, or have things that they want to do. But, of course, they're always obstructed by the bureaucracy and the intriplicate requests and the forms and the orders Mm -hmm. which is the way to get access to the temple by just being the way yep Yep. there's you gave me a thought what's that well you mentioned calderas and i don't know if it was this uh campaign world or my previous one Mm -hmm. i had the caldera from the undead supplement that rollades did uh-huh. Oh, which yes. Is, which is basically a land of the undead, ruled yep. by undead. Yeah, ruled by how, five how, 20th level liches and up. <laughs> how, could you, how could you leverage that with the uh, lawful evil monastery, the connection there? Hmm. I, just got, I just got a crazy idea about zombies with martial arts. <laughs> Well, the problem is zombies are mindless. They can't. They can't do martial arts unless that's what they were in the in the right, juju they, zombies. Thank you. Yeah, Very juju much. zombies would work. All right, uh, ghouls with, with <laughs> martial arts. Ghouls and ghasts. Yeah, I could see that. But yes, I mean, you know, they they paralyze you, and then they just beat the crap out of you with their feet and hands. Yeah, I could see tenderizing that. the meat. Yeah, so to speak. Um, so I thought that would be a good connection there because I wouldn't put a pass and to have any tr- to put some you know have some connection with the undead yeah I could you know I could see some secret double and triple dealing by the lawful evil faction you know at some point um at some point once they uh oops sorry about that um once they get uh once they've amassed enough political power uh, in the quote-unquote normal world that they will be on a level with, you know, the undead, you know, the lords of the undead, and then they can sweep in and destroy the other two sects so they can be the only one left. Right. That's, how, that's what I see. Because, you know, otherwise they wouldn't, they wouldn't even truck with them because, uh, Undead cannot be corrupted, not by not by their means. Let's say, right. And a lot of what monks can do doesn't work very well against some forms of undead. Right. <laughs> As a matter of fact, it can be detrimental to them to try. So, in order to, uh, that's the overarching ambition of the lawful evil chief abbot. You know, who's like, you know. God only knows how many hundreds of years old, like 120 or something like that. And he's 21st level and, you know, he's got the ability. Now, the one thing I also wanted to do was, is that I wanted to change some of the, I want, this is just something off the top of my head as far as the monk class goes. I wanted to change some of the abilities to reflect the different uh, methods of training. Uh, But that's something I've, wanted to do for years and I just never got around to it. But yeah, that that would be that main ambition. 
what's uh, the what's the all defense what's the all defense of martial art um um, um there's one that's called like the eye of the hurricane that's no, like a, a, simple, a simple tai chi tai, not tai chi it's one where oh you can, um like, what aikido or uh, aikido aikido or, aikido the, or i, yeah, I could or i could see the good I can see the good monks doing something like Aikido. Yes, because yeah, I could see that. You know, They're I could see some of them training in and yeah, non-lethal martial arts. Yes, restrain and repel mm-hmm. type of thing. Yeah, I could see that. I could see that, but unfortunately, they've had to over the last several decades. They've had to bring in the martial, you know, not bring in, but in, incorporate the the more deadly martial arts because they were getting the, their lunch handed to them by the lawful evil faction when they would meet. Yeah, but they wouldn't, that would be last resort thing. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah, they would not initially would the, fight to kill unless it was absolutely necessary. I could see you know, that. It's like, it's like Captain America's, uh, you know, necessary force. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, you mean Cap- the Captain White Bread rule? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, only in, yeah, pretty much. It just reminds me of a Captain America comic. They had one, that one character who was basically a god figure, uh-huh. where nobody could attack him because he had a field around him that neutralized any inertia. Oh, that's um, oh, that's uh, what's his name? Um, yeah, oh, what is his name? Well, Sebastian Shaw. That's it. Or well, or, or better no. yet, it, that the, any uh, any uh, direct attacks against him made him stronger. Yeah. Well, no, this was this was more like he negated, so nobody could like you know Hulk couldn't punch him. Yeah. Okay. Because he, he, he converted, but then Cap got him by doing an Aikido hold. Yep. He said, "He said what? He said this is a Aikido hold, my friend. It uses no in- inertia." Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> so that that's what I was thinking with these guys. They could probably do stuff like that, holds and mm-hmm. yeah, holds, you know, locks, joint locks and pain yep. and stuff like that. Yes. Yep. Incapacit, you know, incapacitate, in, incapacitator moves, using, stuff like that. Using the yeah. energy of the enemy against him, mm-hmm. that type of thing. Yep, yeah, I could see that. Jude, judo would go good with them if they want to get a little more, you know, a little more aggressive about it. Mm-hmm. Judo flips and all that. Yeah, judo throws, yes, I could see that. Yeah. You know, but as I said, they're also, they also have probably uh, a several other different forms that are more... Uh, that will do do deal direct damage to their opponents. It's just yes, right. they don't use them unless they're absolutely forced to. Now um, on the other side ahead. of the coin, the evil probably is all about weapons. Oh yeah, they're in martial arts, weapons using poison. You know, uh, uh, it probably Quivering even uh, palm. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, assassination techniques. Yes, I could yeah. see that. You know, uh, being able. You know, probably even having the ability. Uh, high level to backstab as a thief if they wanted to, or, or should I say, in my altered, uh, in my altered game, that yes, thief characters can just basically do flanking and do that damage, you know, and of course, with assassination attempts in combat, uh, if struck unnoticed from behind, you first have to roll on the assassination table. If that doesn't work, then it becomes a backstab, right. <laughs> you know, there things you like that. And the new things would be like anything that works. Exactly. Whatever they, works. Exactly. Whatever t- will take them down the quickest. Mm-hmm. I agree. You know, whether it's highly damaging mar- you know, martial arts that do like 1d8, you know, that can yeah. basically or, kill the average peasant. Throw. Yeah. You know, what, you know, whatever works. You know, they would have a widely ranging martial yeah. art that took... So basically it would them. be... The hard form, the soft form, and the hard soft form. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And the and the neutral guys would be more like taking them down quickly. If we do one or two things and they give up, I surrender. Fine, we stop. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know, of course, they're bound. They're not by, looking. Yeah. They're not looking for total defeat. They're looking for controlling the situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Diffusing the situation. Right. In the most effective way possible, I can see that. Right. Okay, okay, all right, Fawn, your your work's cut out for you because I want to see this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, you are the you are yeah you both you and Glenn are great map makers because I remember the map you yeah. drew, Glenn. 
and we actually use that in a brainstorm. <laughs> you oh, know? oh, you mean my my your, your Earth? Map, yeah. yeah, your Earth, your Earth setting. Oh, can't see I'm it. The light's too bright. Oh, I'm wor I'm working on it now. Yeah, you said yeah, you said you were yeah, you were going to redo it. I saw what you put. There you go. There it is. Yeah, well, I saw I'm what you posted on Facebook. Doing it. I'm just I'm expanding it. See, I put it in like a corner of a blank page so I can expand. Oh, it. oh, oh, you're do oh, you're you're going macro now. You're going bigger. Yeah. Awesome. I I really need to see a continent. <laughs> <laughs> That's really a, well, you know that region that you came up with is really a really good campaign setting. Yeah, if you want to do want to go continent level, yeah, I'll be interested in seeing I'll, it. I'm I'm involved in the Benchley Dale and Beyond campaigns now, so they're really kind of like they said Earth is the next planet over where Benchley Dale is, <laughs> and it's like, and I said basically they're saying okay, go develop. So <laughs> well, the know. gauntlet's been thrown down. I guess so. I'll I'll slowly I'll get to it. Anyway, that's our that's our monasteries, folks. Three wow. flavors to choose from: chocolate, vanilla, or strawberry. Yep. So, if you want to talk to us about it, uh, dickoshammergmail dot com, or you can get dial four zero five eight zero six zero five five five. Yeah, eight six six kick. <laughs> <laughs> One nine hundred dragon punch. Yes. There we go. Let's close. The, let's close this twelfth level of Shaolin. Okay. Yeah. 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 We've gone through all thirty six chambers. We're we're good. <laughs> Say goodbye, Brian. Oh, have a good night, folks. You know, we come up with these things for you guys. And by the way, this is a shout out to everyone who's been a regular emailer to the show. And especially you, Kojo. Keep it up. Yeah, yeah. Send us more stuff. Our mailbox empty. Hurry. <laughs> and thank you for being our listeners. Yes. Uh, full on, you want to say bye? All right, Gamer Nation. Have a wonderful time. Be good, be safe, stay safe, and we'll see you on the other side of the hammer. Yeehaw. And I'm DM Glenn saying we'll see you next time when the hammer comes down on Thank Goes Hammer. Bye-bye. Oh, oh boy. boy. Mm -hmm. you, you that took a turn. <laughs> get my love of monks. Yeah. Well, if you love monks, that what does that make me? I don't know. Thaco's Hammer theme is provided by the Diablo Swing Orchestra. You'll find them on gemendo.com. All other additional music for this episode was provided by Kevin McLeod. You'll find more of his music on incompetech.com. Be sure to visit our website at thacoshammer.info. If you have any questions or comments, email us at thacoshammer at gmail.com. Remember, that's an O, not a zero. You can also find us on the second edition forums at osrgaming.org and at purpleworm.org. Or give us a call and leave us a voicemail at 405-806-0555. See you next time when the hammer comes down on Thaco's Hammer. Thank you.